Okay. Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm really excited to introduce today's speaker at our distinguished speaker series on, on trustworthy information, uh, Professor Katerina Linos. Uh, she is the Irvin G. and Eleanor D. Tragan Professor of Law and Co-Faculty Director of the Miller Institute for Global Challenges in Law. Uh, Deirdre Mulligan uh, knows her and, and she's her guest, but unfortunately has to join us online as she's a little under the weather. Uh, Linos teaches international business transactions, international law, European Union law, and the law of international organizations. And she has a BA, JD, and PhD, all from Harvard College, as they call it. Uh, and it's of particular relevance to the iSchool in our series. She studies how information and misinformation shape refugee and, and migration law. And we have a lot of interest here in the glo global development. So I think this will be really relevant for our audience. And with that, I'd like to just well, help me welcome Katarina up to the podium. So uh, thank you so much um, for inviting me here. I'm really excited because kind of communication is one of the themes in my work today. I'll be talking about refugees and migrants, but I'm hoping to do some future work on a couple of new rules, the Digital Services Act and the Digital Markets Act that affect Silicon Valley tech companies. I've done some past work on how judicial opinions from the Supreme Court get covered by the media and then get communicated. Um, I am being asked here if I should be promoted yeah. to a panelist. Yeah, um, very oh, yeah. that's me. I'm sorry. <laughs> well, ignore so, that. Yes. On that front. Um, and I also am really excited to present this project because it involved a lot of former and some current Berkeley students. So I'm just listing two of them here because they're the most active participants. Uh, Laura Jackley and Melissa Carlson both finished their PhDs at the political science department and one of them now works at the Department of Defense. The other is now a professor at Harvard. So they're pretty amazing collaborators, uh, but these are large team projects that involve people in data sciences, a lot of undergraduates to do Europe, let me also just start by introducing the image here. I'll be talking about refugees and the usual picture for refugees in Europe is people on a beautiful boat, uh, people crossing the borders in really difficult circumstances, people wrapped in silver uh, protective gear. And what I'm emphasizing through this image is the fact that once you get off the boat, once you cross the border, what you need to do is charge your device because that is according to survey work, the most significant tool you have. You'll ask refugees, do you need food? Do you need water? And those are provided for them. But if a border officer takes your phone away, you are facing a lot of difficulty or simply you run out of battery. Let me start with some motivating uh, thoughts. And I have an argument, but I also have just lots and lots of information, which means that if you want to interrupt me at any point and ask a question, maybe after I've done two or three slides, I'm more than eager to just take questions as they come along. I'll tell the online. Thank you so much. Um, so I'll start by saying that in international law, States have obligations, not to everybody who crosses a border, but to refugees, and they have an obligation to, uh, if someone has a well-founded well fear of persecution, not to turn them away. So there's a corresponding right not to be turned away. And kind of one puzzle is that a lot of refugees don't apply for asylum the moment they're eligible. They might continue with their journey. It might be a difficult journey. And a question is like, why? Do you do this? This is, of course, difficult from the perspective of refugees. It's difficult from the perspective of governments. Why don't you apply for asylum when you're first entitled to that? Why do you continue? Uh, because I'm at a law school, we talk about kind of the legal framework and how it is implemented. And in this area, it happens that the baseline laws are the same around the world. So we have uh, an agreement from the 1940s and the 1950s, which says every country in the world should um, not turn away refugees. That's as accepted as international custom. But of course, when you move from the international to the national, to the regional, to the implementation, there are lots and lots of gaps. So I'll be talking about those gaps and also about the framework. 
And the thesis will be that an under studied topic is information dissemination. Uh, information dissemination has changed for everyone because of technology shifts. For refugees and migrants, uh, the added twist often has to do with language. So the idea is that if there are information boxes, information communities, they're often linguistically uniform and thinking about how to move uh, to a multilingual community is a particular challenge. Uh, but the big shift also is that you might distrust a lot of people on your journey. You've never met them. You are by definition fleeing a government that is untrustworthy. You come across some new government information. Do you trust them? Do you not trust them? You're very hopeful if you're taking on this journey. You want certain outcomes to be true. They might not be true. Uh, how does this work? Um, it used to be the case that people relied on word of mouth. Now we have a different information infrastructure website, social media, cost of all of that has gone down dramatically. It's available, but what is trustworthy? Um, this is just a little bit of background uh, for this project. And I now see the chat, uh, which I won't be monitoring, it sounds like there's, oh, fantastic. So let me, I'll be talking about the European refugee crisis. Now, what is the European refugee crisis? It is not the Ukrainian refugee crisis. We don't have a crisis of Ukrainians. Why? Although there's more than 4 million people across the border, the policy framework is totally different for Ukrainians than what it was for Syrians and Afghanis. So I'll be talking about events um, from 2015 to 2016, but I'm very eager to talk about what's happening now, which is a very different response. This response in Europe, this European refugee crisis influenced a lot of policy decisions in 2018. So at the global level, we have new rules as of 2018, and now the Europeans have a totally different response. But it's nevertheless a story that is told from multiple perspectives and a very influential story. I will start with the official story as told by the government perspectives, and then I'll turn to what um, we did, uh, which was to retell the story try to retell it, try to reconstruct it from the perspective of migrants and refugees and in the process figure out who's informing whom and how people respond. So the official uh, European refugee crisis story is that the civil war happens in Syria, refugees flee to Turkey and then cross over from Turkey into Europe and flee to various European countries. It is a story that prioritizes Syrian over other types of uh, migrants and refugees. So at the time, there were almost as many Afghani as Syrian people, um, but they don't figure prominently in the official story. The official story is about Syrians. The Syrians get much better treatment than the Afghanis. There are also migrants moving from North Africa. They're at the very bottom of the list in terms of rights and practices, but it's a Syrian story. Um, it's a story that involves a lot of boat rescues and a lot of dissolution of the common European integration project. So European Union is about um, free movement of goods and capital initially and of people, and it was supposed to be border free, but suddenly lots of borders are being reintroduced. Why to stop migrants from crossing from one country to another? There was a moment when Germany uh, intervenes. Uh, Angela Merkel says, we can do this. And this is interpreted as in many different ways. Uh, but one of the ways this is interpreted is look, Germany will not turn back to Austria, will not turn back to Greece, will not turn back to Turkey, people who made it to Germany. So this is a moment uh, on this graph. Um, I put it in September 2015, after which more um, monthly refugee or arrivals are recorded in the UNHCR. So that's kind of the moment, kind of the doors open. And there's another moment that I'll speak to about in a moment, which is when the doors close. Um, in the interim, people in Germany ask Angela Merkel, what did you mean? And there's all these clarification documents, their efforts to rearrange the legal framework. I'm more than happy to talk about all of that. But the big moment, which according to the official story ends the crisis is a deal with Turkey. So, in March 2016, Turkey has given about 4 billion euro in exchange for basically closing the door to new arrivals. If you look at the numbers, um, actually the refugee flow has already been stemmed a little earlier than that deal. 
but certainly like the attention of the world to the European refugee crisis ends in March 2016. The, Europe, the refugees themselves uh, don't see that as the key endpoint, but that's the official story. And what my team and I wanted to do uh, was to look at the European refugee crisis from the perspective of refugees. We were extraordinarily lucky because we got some grant funding from Citrus, some grant funding from the Carnegie Foundation, and a lot of programs here at Berkeley that benefit us. For example, the Europe program allowed uh, me to work with a lot of undergraduates who are fluent in Farsi and Arabic, because that's basically the first step, like refugees and migrants speak other languages, and this has a huge impact on how, how will their story be um, told. So we created this website, which is available in English and um, also Arabic and Farsi. If you're Googling something right now, that would be a great uh, place to Google. Just go to digital uh, refuge.berkeley.edu. So uh, we thought we would create um, this story and kind of we have lots and lots of tabs, but just I'll point you to the very last one, which is kind of how Berkeley students um, contributed, uh, not only through translation skills, but also through technical skills. I'm incredibly proud of this website. So if you have questions, we want to interrupt you. So, so tell me, what can I find? Um, I will tell you all about it. Um, but let me go back to the official story and show some pictures to illustrate how refugee stories are told and not told and what the role of information and misinformation is. So one of the core themes um, that I'll be emphasizing is that governments are not communicating appropriately to refugees. Uh, international organizations, even more reputed ones like UNHCR, do not have the reputation among the populations they serve that they believe uh, they have. So this is a picture from uh, the border between Greece and um, the former Yugoslav Republic of Macedonia. This is a picture of displaced people just staying at the border after announcements have been made that the border will not open. Uh, this is a story about people who stayed there under horrific conditions. There was violence, there was, it was winter. Um, they believed that the border will open. They distrusted all the government officials who said, the border will not open. And kind of the next picture is they left when riot police physically moved them. They were planning on staying, and this was not uh, what governments intended. Why? Because they believed, they wanted to believe that the border will allow them to walk on to uh, Germany. This is a different story of a crisis, both from the perspective of refugees and from the perspective of governments. When uh, people cross, from Turkey to Greece on boats, the first island or one of the first islands is the island of Lesbos. The Greek government decided to turn that into a detention camp, um, the Moria detention camp. At some point it was set on fire. Um, this was kind of a big item, both from a human rights perspective and from later kind of how xenophobia was built up. I'll come to this point in just a second. Um, so um, what we were able to do was to say, okay, this is what the media is covering. It is covering the violence, it is covering the hatred, it is covering what's happening in this camp that is deliberately overcrowded. What if we take the statistics and map it out on digital refuge? So what we've done on this particular map is we've said, look, let's find all of the refugee centers in Greece at the time. Let's look at the official statistics on capacity and say, well, are they all overcrowded? Are some overcrowded? What's happening? Where are the stories coming from? What um, we've colored here, so the size of the circles is how big the camps are, their official capacity, and their color is how much uh, occupancy do they have? Are they empty or are they occupied? So kind of there's this huge camp in Lesbos and Moria, kind of that's the big purple circle and it's over capacity and that's where all the crisis is happening, but they're big white circles on the mainland and there's some research question there, which I will get to later if people are interested as to why the Greek government would have empty camps on the mainland and prevent people from moving from the overcrowded centers to the, to the mainland. I think this is a different type of misinformation. I think it was the thought that if you keep the refugees away from the mainland, there'll be less 
backlash, less xenophobia. In fact, um, excellent research after the fact showed that there was a, a far right, violent far right party that emerged with support exactly from those islands. Like it was very clear what the cause and effect was because of the unusual geographic uh, pattern. So that did not work as intended. Um, but that's kind of one of the ways of looking at this. So just to get into more detail over what how we can understand the European refugee crisis, we can understand it as a crisis of European policy implementation. Again, the European project is all about open borders and all the borders suddenly closed. This is before COVID. Of course, this happened again during COVID. Um, we have legal protection for some categories of people, but not a particularly good sorting uh, mechanism and people who are entitled to these legal benefits not applying for them. Um, just in the first year, 2015, so this was 2015, 2016, almost a million people successfully crossed the Mediterranean. They're not applying for asylum. Why is that? And this is not an outcome that is safe or satisfying. What is our argument? Uh, our question is why do we have such an implementation crisis? And we will argue that rumors and misinformation proliferate in ordinary times. Um, unfortunately, in this country, as in many other countries, this topic is now well established that you can have uh, rumors proliferating. But in crisis situations, you can have negative feedback cycles that are more acute than at other times. Um, these feedback cycles can lead to non-compliance with a lot of non-governmental policies and just undermine governmental capacity in these moments. Um, more specifically, what I'll be doing, unless I get interrupted, and I'm more than glad to be interrupted at any point in time, I'll be talking about what we already know about crisis management, what exactly my team and I are adding, and then I'll talk, I'll be talking a lot about methods. So I'm fascinated by how we study um, rumors among refugees, rumors more generally. It used to be the case that the way you did this was through the anthropological techniques. I'm an anthropologist. I'll be living in a specific camp for a couple of years. I'll build trust and people will tell me what they believe, why they believe it, how rumors spread. And I'll write just a fascinating story about this one camp. With technology, rumors travel in a different way and we can also study them in different ways on a much larger scale. And if you want to ask questions about methodology, I'm open to those. Um, I'll be talking at the very end about scope conditions, like when might rumors not spread? What are some circumstances when um, more accurate information might flow? And also what to make uh, of this for different crisis situations, which seem to uh, repeat themselves. Um, we take one moment to pause for questions and I can keep on going if you would rather. Okay. Again, people who are online, feel free to post to the Q&A if you have questions. I will assume everyone is just mesmerized and has no questions and I will keep on going. Okay, so why, why do we have problems in the enforcement of laws? Information is not the number one answer people have. So number one answer is look, this is strategic. The governments can decide whether to enforce or whether to under enforce. We never have perfect enforcement. Tax authorities accept bribes in much of the world. And like, that's a nice equilibrium. It usually works to advantage the rich people, but sometimes it will allow like street vendor communities to operate that you wouldn't otherwise have. And here the argument is, look, Greece was turning a blind eye intentionally. Like Greece said, all these refugees are coming to us please give us help, but really we'll also just wink and have them go on to Germany because that means that the problem is not ours for long. Another um, central um, theory as to why governments don't properly implement their program is because of capacity and bureaucratic obstacles, right? Like Berkeley has all these rules. We don't necessarily <laughs> put the staff um, who are allocated to the right positions. I was just um, doing a podcast on the United Nations. Every international organization has this charter with these lofty goals. It will have world peace and global economic development, but we're just not going to pay for it, right? That's this mismatch between what your laws are and how many people you put to enforce it is particularly acute in countries that are poor, 
in uh, countries that have gone through like really big transitions recently. I mean, the European countries, generally, you don't worry that much about low state capacity. This is a theory that comes out of the development literature and doesn't apply as much. Um, there is a literature on frontline workers, which is uh, fascinating. It focuses on how some people um, get, pres some people are presumed to be deserving and will be offered welfare, will be offered asylum, will be offered different kind of treatment over others. Um, but it's not obvious exactly how this applies here. The big theory in the world of migration is push-pull factors. So migrants move to labor markets that are more robust. Um, migrants follow networks of co-ethnics and family. If your cousin has settled in this particular village in Germany, that's where you're likely to be because you can both set up your barbershop. And uh, that's how kind of that's just the dominant theory in sociology and economics. Uh, so this is kind of how we'll explain why people don't apply initially for asylum because who on earth speaks Greek and the dream you had was not to resettle in Greece. You've never heard of Greece. It's just the first geographic point. Um, there are also some theories about what the role of governments are in rumor dissemination. And the theories go as follows. I am the Russian government, or I'm the CIA. And what I want to do is disseminate certain kinds of false rumors or true rumors. I want to talk about my opponent's many affairs. I want to tell that the operation in Ukraine will target this region rather than that region. I want to say that actually Ukraine will launch this nuclear weapon as a false flag operation. So there's an, a branch of the government that is in the intelligence services and they are actively spreading rumors in order to shift an election outcome, in order to misinform. Um, and this is what will then lead to low trust in the government, low compliance with the policies. Um, what we are adding to this discussion is that even governments and international organizations that are more benign can make a lot of mistakes. And policies designed to control crises may actually um, contribute to rumor formation and to distress. And there are three policies in particular that were widely used in this crisis that we think, you know, as a takeaway lesson, should not be used in the same way or the, the pros and cons should be rethought. So one of them is frequent policy shifts. Um, I'll talk about, this was benign. People come in and you realize you are not prepared for mass influx. You don't have a registration system. Uh, you don't have the staff and also nobody speaks the language. So instead of you know, training all these frontline workers in Arabic or Farsi, you're like, okay, let's just design a call center to do this. Uh, and then you change the policy one more time because the call center, like people are, uh, you know, people believe the call center is a scam because nobody ever picks up. So then you go back to saying like, okay, like we're going to have a bus that will register people. So you just change the policy because it's a crisis and what a crisis response often involves is new circumstances and new policies. But this is not necessarily good from the perspective of people developing trust because your responses might come a little too late and might not be um, as widely as effective as uh, you want them to be. Another policy that uh, is implemented both by national governments and by international organizations is limits on information dissemination. Uh, let me uh, be more specific. In the refugee context, there's a process by which your, your um, application for asylum will either be granted or denied, or if you don't get asylum, you might get subsidiary protection. There, and people, if you call before the process is completed, you will be given no information and your lawyer will be given no information. And if you're a migrant or a refugee and you have a couple of options, like do I trust UNHCR that like a week from now, they'll just come up with the approval process because I am eligible, or do I trust the smuggler who's telling me like, you're never going to get a yes. Like this process, they're just, you don't know who to trust. And the policy for UNHCR, uh, the UN agency involved here, and for governments, it's like we say nothing until we have either a denial or an approval. And that, um, like we can't tell you, for example, as a statistical matter, if you're a Syrian national, the chances that you're going to get one or the other forms of protection are 
higher than 90%, right? Higher than 99% at certain times. Like that would be like good information. Like, I don't know what's gonna happen to your claim if you're Afghani, it's 50-50, right? If you are uh, Nigerian, it's 10%. Like you don't get that information from the government. You don't get that information from your lawyer. You might get it, you might not have a lawyer, but the government says like, we have, you know, we, we disseminate information. We are a bureaucracy, we have our systems. We do what we wanna do. And then of course, the other big issue is there's a gap between policy implementation uh, and the policy as stated. We argue that all of this leads to uncertainty and um, uncertainty leads to low compliance with policy. So what's the relationship there? So I'm really uncertain about what's happening. I'm going to seek out information from whoever is willing to give it to me. If UNHCR won't pick up, if um, you know the governments will just not give me any kind of information, I'll go to informal sources. I'll go to my ethnics. They speak my language. There are people who are going to make money from me, you know, from from giving information. They might have much better customer service. I'm also a refugee, right? I want to move on. I am an optimist. I may not trust the information from the smuggler. But what are my options? I want to act as if um, this information might be true. I'm hopeful it will be true. So I might not comply with the official policy. I might instead pick the smuggling uh, route. Let me give you a brief story here. And then, uh, yeah, if you want more stories, you can just ask for stories rather than statistics. So um, two stories. One of the one of the co-authors I mentioned, Melissa Carlson, she speaks Arabic, um, so kind of the lack of translators was so acute that we, we tried to get into various camps and they said, no, 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 you fill out a form, you wait in line. And then she's like, but I speak Arabic. She's like, oh, come on in like this minute, like our, our medics need you or like, so there's like this really big shortage. So she just through this Arabic language competency, she like was a volunteer for all kinds of organizations. So she worked, helped these medics, helped the Danish Refugee Council, helped all these bodies. And some of them were organized volunteer organizations. So they had a script. And part of the script was, um, well, when people come and ask you, like, what is happening with my asylum claim? When will that be processed? The right answer is, please go to UNHCR. They will tell you the answer. And the response that she got when she gave that answer was laughter. Like, of course, we've tried UNHCR. Of course, they're not going to give us any kind of information. That's why I'm asking you. And you're telling me to go back to the source. Like, this is useless. So what, um, how did we go about like testing this theory, developing this theory, look, trying to create kind of a better understanding of what's happening on the ground? Um, there are some issues that um, I think are true in all communities, when you're a minority community, when you believe that your point of view is uh, not well respected. Uh, this could be Republicans with extreme views on immigration. It could be refugees. Um, here on refugees and migrants, it's really language that adds a very big barrier. Also, if you are engaging in an activity which is not 100% legal, that might be another reason why you want um, anonymity. So it turns out that in international law, I don't have a right to travel safely. So if I'm being persecuted in my home government and the government has targeted me because I'm a political uh, refugee and I've been uh, protesting and like they've threatened me and I, I fear for my life, I am entitled not to be turned back to danger if I make it to Germany or I make it to Greece or I make it to the United States. But I don't have a right to cross the border. Um, so, so in order to apply for asylum, I almost by definition need to break some kind of law because um, there's sometimes exit restrictions that governments shouldn't have. There are entrance requirements. If I go through more than one country, there, there isn't a right to travel. So, so I'm, I'm very possibly breaking some kind of rules. Um, the way the rules are implemented uh, is very um, arbitrary. That's the mildest world. So we have you know, these challenges from a research perspective to find out what's happening. So what we did um, was to kind of triangulate. So one technique is ethnography. We, I'm, oh, I, I should mention some stuff about me. I'm originally from Greece, so I write about all these projects. Um, that means that if, I, if there's 
you know, Greek government official, I can speak to them and I can figure out like how to work through the system, but I don't speak Farsi or Arabic, so I work with people who do. Um, you can find Arabic speakers, you cannot find Farsi speakers. So Farsi is um, shared to some extent between Afghanistan and Iran. So a lot of the people I ended up working with were not Afghani, they were um, Iranian who can work better with the written language than with the spoken language, but we basically like just cut corners and did what we could. Um, so we did kind of firsthand kind of ethnography observation. Then we were very, very lucky in that this problem of disinformation was a really big problem for the aid community, for the international community. So both in Greece and uh, in Bangladesh for the Rohingya community and in Italy, one of the activities USAID funds is NGOs to go and do rumor dissemination correction. So there are NGOs um, and their job is to do kind of what we were doing, like just collect the rumors every week and figure out what people are saying and then issue a newsletter every week that says like, these are five things that are demonstrably false. And we will just you know, give you five things that are false and we will give this to you in five languages. That's the goal. So they did this for the duration of the crisis a little bit before, a little bit longer. And once they had done all of this and we had all the newsletters, they said like, hey, like, do you want the data? Like, why not? So they gave us all of their interview data um, and that interview data was kind of in-person conversations. They had said they had built more trust. They had a hotline, they had in-person and online. So they just had a much bigger number from many more spots than we could get to. And then our other um, triangulation method was Facebook. So I don't know what Facebook groups you're in. Um, I shouldn't ask because they might reflect interests that you don't wanna share with everyone, but um, as you might imagine, just as you know, Facebook has created communities for uh, people who are geographically isolated, there are also refugee uh, Facebook groups. Um, I can tell you a lot about them because we looked for them, we tried to identify them. We work only with the public Facebook groups. This was before Facebook changed the rules. So at some point after Cambridge Analytica, the rules changed a lot. So we were a little bit before and we were able to do some work. Um, obviously everything is de-identified, but we could look at the content of what is posted and I will tell you a little bit about that. Um, so what this allows us to do is to move kind of beyond a single cam and to tell you, well, this might be happening in Moria. This is what where all the journalists are, but this is what's happening kind of in this other empty cam. And this is what's happening to the Afghanis and this is what's happening to the Syrians. Um, and uh, it allows us for all of this comparison. I will just pause for a moment in case there are any questions. Yes, thank you. And you can say like a couple of things about yourself. Like this is my first talk at the iSchool, so I don't know much. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Hi, my name is Helena. I'm a second year PhD student um, in CS, computer science. Um, and my question is like, I'm, I'm actually scared to ask this question because I don't want it to be like an idea that I support because I'm very cautious of like machine translation systems in general. But when you were talking about like human translators, was there at any point an effort to use machine translation? Um, what a great question. So I'm so glad that someone from computer science is here. Okay, so let me tell you. So the short answer is we thought about it and it didn't work. Uh, but let me talk a little bit more about some of my collaborators. So when I was doing my PhD, I was like learning all these methods. I was like making maps. It took me like a million years to make a really ugly map. And then I became a professor and got grants. And people are like, hey, how about you pay us? Uh, to do stuff we're really good at. So I ended up working with some really good data scientists. And here's what they were able to do for me. So um, one of the things we needed to do was like web scraping, that's pretty easy. And then the next thing we wanted to, well, it's not that easy actually. The, the reason it's not that easy is because there's like many, many things you can't web scrape. So like a lot of people are gonna be on WhatsApp. WhatsApp is not something that you can get access to. Facebook has private and public groups. You're gonna say different things on the public groups than in the private groups. There's a language issue. There's all of this code. Like, so, so the Facebook posts are not necessarily, you know, like extended essays that you could translate and figure out what the words are. So we did try a little bit to see, we didn't try for this translation. For the translation, we ended up doing it manually rather than automatically, even though I think it was a little before 
some of the translation tools that are so available today. So I don't know that we would do the same today that we would have done a few years ago, uh, just because I'm just so impressed with what is available there. And then we tried to do some automatic sentiment coding, but we ended up doing manually. So I'll show you some uh, graphs later, which I like highlight after March 16th, the world forgot about refugees after March 2016, but like the refugees themselves, like they're really upset about all of this. So we ended up doing a lot of this manually in part because maybe we didn't have quite the right CS collaborator, maybe because the technology was a little older, maybe because our, our corpus wasn't that big um, and maybe because of the language and code issue. So it's not, um, so kind of, what do I really like about what we did do? So one is we did do the translation, we did do things on scale. The other thing which I love and had not done before is the software Tableau. So in, uh, I'm seeing people who nod and know what this is. You all know what this is? Okay, I'll just say it in case somebody doesn't. So in my field, uh, kind of when I was doing my PhD in political science and what people do in law and sociology and in social sciences, they say like, I have a theory, I will analyze the data, I will show you some regression coefficient that shows that my theory is right, uh, even if you control for these things. And if you're very sophisticated, I've done an experiment. I have like this amazing research design so you can really trust my analysis. Um, what Tableau does, and the website it uses Tableau, and this is just something that the data science people said, like, hey, like you don't need to have a theory. Like, I'll just do all the data translation, the data cleaning. Someone can go to your website and say, like, hey, what if I like filter the data by age? I'm really interested. Maybe like young people are more optimistic than old people. Maybe Afghanis are more pessimistic than Syrians. They should be. Like, just put the data out there, and people can just move these filters and do the kind of analysis you would do through like cross tabs for themselves, even if they. Know, don't have CS background. So, I, so I'm really glad that we were able to do that. But that's about as far um, as we went. The other very interesting thing, so at some point the world stopped paying attention to this crisis, but refugees and migrants were still there. So a number of Berkeley students set up um, apps to try to keep on basically translating. So one of the coal apps is like the Greek government says like, here are the new rules. This is where you need to like, we never made the, uh, permits long enough, now everybody who meets these criteria gets an extension. How do you get that information to the person who needs it when that person is hiding and does not speak Greek? Um, there were a couple of Berkeley groups that worked on this just really concrete issue of like, how do I design an app? The bot failed, like there were, there were some applications just didn't work, but the kind of a, a simpler format, which was like the weekly like website with the information is still um, ongoing. So I do have a question, another question if you like. Yes, from Deirdre, actually. She said, differences between the rumors you identified through Facebook and those identified by the aid, or I guess, what are the differences between the Facebook rumors and those identified by the aid organizations? So that is a great question. And um, one I can't fully answer, but I will. So I will be showing you some slides of kind of different cuts, but we wanted, we wanted to be able to answer that question. We wanted to be able to say like, hey, like, we had some theories that we couldn't test at the end of the day. So let me tell you some of the theories and what we did not succeed in getting done uh, and why. So we thought like, okay, the online community is gonna be totally different from the in-person community. In person, you're not gonna say, hey, by the way, like I know I'm not entitled to this, but is there a way? Like if I, if I lie, like would uh, you know, uh, an officer believe me? You're not gonna ask that. In person, online, you might well find like the script. Like if you wanna apply for asylum, say that you are born in this city and persecuted for this reason, and the officers on the other half side know that then your document will be sent. So you might find, like you might get more um, scripts. And there are stories from officers that saying like, no, I can't possibly, like I've heard this same story a lot of times. I know it is false. So we did have some expectation that there would be uh, more, more anonymity, more misinformation on Facebook than online, um, than in person. We uh, kind of, at the end of the day, the data I will show you, we ended up going with a triangulation approach rather than a differences approach, just because we just don't trust anyone source. Like we had so many data limitations at the end of the day, that if there's something that I can support through the ethnography and through the Facebook and through the um, uh, interviews, I, I will tell you about it, the other stuff, I just don't know whether to think like, oh, my information source and my analysis, like I've made some mistake, like this is super interesting, but can I trust it? 
versus like, no, this is a real difference between the interview data. Like the quality of the data isn't that good at the end of the day. At the same time, it's much better to have some data, three sources of data than to have nothing, which is the, the world before. So not a, not a convincing answer. I'll, I'll show you slices of the data, but mostly I'll show it to you when there's some logic to it and I'm not finding totally contradictory bits, uh, even as I wanted to point to differences initially. Um, so I'll just start with like a little bit about kind of the semi-structured interviews, like what we did in person initially. Um, these are like, you know, on the order of 100, like not bad for ethnography, not great, um, but uh, kind of a, a mix of speaking to government officials, speaking to aid workers, speaking to refugees in different sites. So kind of the participant observation. I've mentioned Moria, this is the very violent camp. Pires is like the big harbor in Greece. So like you're gonna get a lot of different people and uh, Skarma Gas is a particular camp which had both um, both Afghani and Syrian refugees. Um, so what do we find from this ethnography? Um, first, just a, what was the Greek government doing? They were really changing the policies and then they were not sharing information about the asylum process. This is an illustration of what Greek information sharing looks like. So it's a, a piece of A4 paper. It's in Arabic, right? So they thought like, okay, we will translate. They put it on two poles outside the camp, and they are hoping that refugees will get to this. But it's outside the camp rather than disseminated within the camp. And these are um, camps with really specific gender norms. So the women are not allowed to go outside of the camp. So this information, I mean, I don't know if any of you speak Arabic, but even if you don't speak Arabic, it's a pretty complicated flowchart. So this is the official information that's translated like the European Union is trying to do like comprehensive stuff it's translated from an EU directive it has the stamps of the you know the UNHCR the UN agency the Greek government yeah so kind of the border security into the EU is the official version and it looks pretty complicated and it's small and I want to show to you what you get on Facebook this is from Gillespie another uh, researcher who's working this is not original to us but it's just a very different visual. So here, again, like your Arabic language has not improved, but you see some words in Arabic translated into kind of the keyword. So like, what is your next city? Like you're going from Izmir to Greece to, you can't read Greek, but it's close enough to Athena. So it's in, in Greek to Macedonia to Thessaloniki, another Greek city. You see the vehicle, like this is a boat crossing. This is a train crossing. This you need to walk. You see a price, like what's the going rate for smuggling. And then at the end of the deal, it's like you're, you see kind of the vision, like it's linear, you're gonna go through Greece, you're gonna walk through Serbia, you're gonna walk through Hungary, and you're gonna make it to Germany, right? That's the, the vision of the world according to refugees. Like much from a communication design perspective, like much better, right, than the EU poster. Um, not that you necessarily want to promote this particular goal. This is not the goal. So the EU official goal, like if you go back to that poster in Arabic, what it says is, I can tell you not because I can read Arabic, but because it's been in many languages is look, if you have family in Germany, you need to tell us in Greece and we will move you to Germany. We're going to be moving some people in Germany and we're going to be leaving other people in Greece. And some people, we have this whole plan. Like some people will go to Italy. There's this country called Portugal that really wants a lot of people and nobody knows about Portugal. So they have a plan. But it's not the same plan and it's not communicated in a way that is audience friendly. So um, kind of coming back to how these policy changes and these rumors affect uh, perceptions, there's lots of, of distrust in UNHCR and Greek officials and lots of uh, worries that the whole process is a scam. Um, so there is this system of pre-registration. Uh, supposedly, you're going to get a message on your mobile. People ask, did you get a message? Nobody has uh, one of these. This is from the interview data that we didn't do. This is from the interview that the NGOs did to correct. Like, this is all a lie. Um, there's positive rumors. Like, you register, and you immediately get housing and money, um, different amounts of money. I'll show you on different slides. And then um, some theories about, like, why you don't have Wi-Fi. And the idea that you don't have Wi-Fi 
is on purpose because the Greek government just does not want us to connect to the outside world. Now, if you are from Greece, you know that that's not the reason why you don't have Wi-Fi. You know, it's because they put the camp in the middle, I mean, they did put the camp in the middle of nowhere in order to isolate people, but the Wi-Fi problem is a technical problem that then gets fixed. I think I saw a question. And if you don't mind introducing yourself, I'm my name is Dean. I'm a student at um, in the new program here at high school, and I do was actually not that. Right? <laughs> you mind speaking up a little bit because there's some people. I'm a, a graduate student here at the high school um, in the MIMS degree program, and since that I got my MPA at the Golden School. My question is about like the rate of trust drop off. That happens. I can imagine, you know, depending on the impact of that rumor, that drop off in trust and, and you know, disrupt whatever plans somebody might have um, in government. And you know, just curious about how quickly is that happening? Is it you know, people get here, they hear a couple of things, and then they're just shutting off organizations completely into their decision making. That is a fantastic question that I would say I have no answer to, but I do in fact have something that could, um, let me see if I have something here. So I think I have some way of answering that question, which is not great, but it is, let me see if I have this. Let me see, okay. So one thing we were able to do for a digital refuge is to organize things over time. So let me, let me see if I can show you one slide and tell you how I might use the filter. So. What we have is we took the Facebook posts, translated them and coded them in a variety of ways, including um, how positive or negative they were and what topic they were. And kind of the overall, I'll show you kind of two screenshots, but we can go to the website and filter through and I'll show you a couple of screenshots that speak to this. So one is like how stuff gets really red, kind of the bottom, the people are much more positive in 2015 than they are in 2016. And if you look at the months, like the later months of 2016 are just far more negative. And what changes is, you know, the border closes, people are worried about deportations. That's kind of one way of getting to this question of trust. Another is, let me see, you can filter kind of general sentiment by country. So we coded the posts and said like, and now that you're saying something negative or positive, like, are you talking about Germany? Are you talking about Greece? Are you talking about, um, Morocco, and here are kind of the filters I selected where I picked the Arabic language ones rather than the Farsi ones. And I picked all, again, kind of like our N isn't huge. So I picked all of them together and just listed kind of the countries people are talking about in Arabic while well, they're talking about Syria, they're talking about Turkey, Germany, Greece, that I'll show you some maps like why they're picking these countries and not others. To me, what's really interesting is that they are much more negative about their home countries than about any of the host countries. So maybe like Greece has these terrible policies, but the sentiment is overall much more positive than if you're talking about Syria, than if you're talking about Morocco, than if you're talking about Algeria or Lebanon, right? So that can give you some kind of sense of like where, you, it doesn't really give you the drop off. Like if you combine, if we had more data, we could look at kind of over time. I can't imagine that you are a refugee uh, and you are, happy with your home country. So a lot of these Facebook posts won't be like about refugees themselves, but like, did you hear this Afghan minister just got this big bribe? Or like, hey, our soccer team won. There's gonna be other kinds of conversations, um, but you talk a lot about your home government and you talk, you're not super positive, right? If you were super positive, probably you wouldn't have uh, taken on a really dangerous journey. And you come across these obstacles, which are very significant and still you're more positive and perhaps more trusting. But I, uh, yeah, like the rate of change, like that's like how, how quickly do you need to mess up in order to have these outcomes? That is totally critical. Can you rebuild trust if, um, if you have um, lost it? Yes. A question from Soleil al -Humain. I'm curious how you define a rumor, quote unquote, considering a disingenuous political statement, the line between fact and lies can be blurry. Great, right? So we had to do this, like we're talking about rumors and kind of rumors can be true, right? The, the, the border will open, uh, it ends up not being true in this particular case, but you don't know at the time the statement is made, whether it's true or not, like hoping it will open or like it will cost you. Um, so we ended up focusing on rumors that ended up 
being untrue. So we ended up focusing, for example, on the, these rumors that were then corrected through misinformation, but a lot of rumors you will never know if they are true. Um, Another way to define a rumor is to kind of, it has to do with kind of how widely it is spread. Like if I can come up with a science fiction idea and nobody believes me and it doesn't spread at all. And some rumors that are totally out of science fiction do spread a lot. Um, so we, we work kind of, we ended up limiting our qualitative analysis to information that we ultimately believed was false. Um, but, that's not the most satisfying. I mean, you, you'd want a different definition of a rumor um, for different uh, purposes. I'd say we typically only go, you know, maybe probably for about five to 10 more minutes. So maybe I will, um, should I open for questions? What, what should we, what's the best way? Let's make a finishing point you'd like to make really nice. Let me show you a map, um, like the mental map of refugees versus the real map. So this is like a map of Europe. So the European Union uh, has said, like, we'll, we'll create this thing called MyFix. We'll tell you which countries are receptive, which countries are not receptive. The good countries are in blue. The hostile ones are in red. Um, what we have overlaid on this map are circles which say like, do refugees talk about them at all on Facebook? So Portugal, I mentioned earlier, is a great country. Nobody would know this. You go to Scandinavia, people talk a lot about Sweden. Nobody has heard of Finland or Norway or talks about it. Um, so people talk like the mental map, kind of that, that arrow I showed you earlier, like that's supported by kind of just counts of how often countries are mentioned. Another way to look at this mismatch is kind of, again, the European Union said like, we will allocate refugees based on population and um, capacity. And then there's this plan that seems rational on one side and then kind of which countries people actually talk about like Germany and Sweden are up there, maybe France and Britain. And then after that, the mental map does not include the rest of Europe, um, some rumors that consist with this, like nobody knows anything about Bulgaria, Lithuania, I don't know anything about Lithuania. In Germany, life is great, like you're gonna get all this money upon arrival. Um, let me maybe say one last thing about Ukraine and then I will end. So before, so the European refugee crisis ends, um, we have lots of asylum applicants, here we have the Trump administration. We have these first serious efforts at the UN level to say, um, we need to share responsibility for refugees. It is crazy that four countries in the world, so like Turkey and Pakistan and another two developed middle income countries are hosting like 30% of the world's refugees. We need to help pay for uh, this. We need to have some um, responsibility sharing arrangements and we coded all of them. Um, this was right before the Ukraine crisis. And we said, well, it's really progressive if you take on a bunch of refugees and resettle them or if you pay a lot of money and if you do this through a treaty and it's really regressive if you do it in uh, the opposite way the Trump administration was doing, was like basically threatening to cut up aid in Northern Triangle countries unless they would take on refugees who they could no, not protect. So it was pretty regressive. That was easy to do. This third safe country agreements are all very regressive. So we created a chart. We allocated this and then came the Ukraine response. The Ukraine response is off the charts. Like literally they, uh, the Ukraine response was, um, you wanna come into Europe, great, you show your passport. We don't need to make a status determination. And in fact, you wanna pick your country, like just, just go to the country where you have friends. That's literally in the instrument. Like you don't have to, we don't, we have the system of allocation and borders and we're not doing any of that for the Ukrainians. So we don't have a Ukrainian refugee crisis, which is kind of a good situation to be in. There are other ways that there's the political will that doesn't necessarily lead to uh, this uh, solution. So um, are there situations when we don't have rumors? If you have stable, developed situations, not crises, maybe that's where you don't have rumors and every other condition you do have rumors. And um, takeaway points, rumors matter. Governments contribute to their own formation, not only when they're trying to actively spread them, but also when they're changing policies. 
And um, kind of as we're thinking about this, consider that refugees, just like everyone else, is on their phone. Um, let me maybe stop the slide share and see if there are any questions. And I don't want to run over time. Yeah, we have your time for questions. So thank you. Um, yeah. So I'm, I'm David Madden, a social professor here. I do a lot of work that's in the space of uh, text analysis and NLP. So some of what you're saying here sounds like it's at least somewhat adjacent to what I do. Um, now, I would love for you, you didn't get a chance to talk much about the Facebook data that you're using, but I would love to just get a sense of how that fits into the rumor work. I mean, it makes sense that you're using it for a couple of reasons. That it gives you longitudinal data, right? It's not just like the ethnographic data you used, where you were taking um, a snapshot in time and interviewing people there about their stances about what these rumors are. But you at least have the ability to talk about or to, to take measurements about how people feel about ideas or concepts, uh, whether they like them or they don't. But are you also extracting something about rumor in Facebook? So we could do a couple of things with Facebook data that I didn't talk about. So one is like the data is not high quality data. Like I'm a law professor and we like scanning like contracts and we have thousands of identical contracts and like this is not the best purpose for text analysis. And that's kind of why we go more manual. What Facebook allows you to do is you can look at likes and like what's popular, what's not popular. So that's really useful when you're doing rumor analysis. You can do a little bit of over time, as you said, you can look at um, content. So like one of the things we looked at, which was interesting to me in the rumor context was like, who is linking to official sources? Like which government? is succeeding, it, like a number of governments wanted to tell people just don't come to us. Like, was anyone actually succeeding in that? And the answer is yes, like Australia created this one video that got a ton of likes within these communities that said like, no, you cannot cross the ocean. So like no other government source was ever kind of linked to in any kind of much like uh, post. So we can do some other observational stuff. So for example, we love refugee groups started where they were supposed to be multilingual and they never took off. So all the Facebook communities are monolingual. That was something that was like really strongly supported by the data and can help uh, by policy. Um, what else Facebook as text? I mean, yeah, lots of other, like what other kinds of events that happen in the home country get picked up again, like sports matches or elections or like some big scandal that's covered in uh, some newspaper. What else is good about Facebook data that we did? Yeah, I, I we started kind of in answering you know to your discussions with more ambitions on what we would be able to do, but we you know were happy that we could do what we did because it was you know progress over what had been done mm -hmm. before, and then also Facebook shut down. I think they were reopened. I think, um, but. My understanding is that you were scraping Facebook and not building, like, it's not them like giving you data. Exactly. So we were scraping consistent with the policies at the time. Yeah. Um, we got information from students who were able to. Um, so I had some very creative students who told me like, hey, like if I post a so-and-so, I can get in this other group and get like all this other information. And there was some question like, could we use that? And we didn't. So, um, you know, one of the, so, so we did the public ones. Um, the public ones have some other features, right? So like you can look at smuggler ads. They're pretty interesting. Like what are smugglers promising to people? Like what are the going rates? Uh, what kind of comforts are you promised if you pick the higher rate? So kind of who is posting and why are, uh, people posting. Um, but we did not work with Facebook. In speaking to other people who have worked with Facebook, my understanding is that Facebook might not be as open after Cambridge Analytica to researchers, but that the Europeans will force them to do that. So my sense is that there are these two new rules. Um, and part of those two new rules uh, are requiring data sharing with researchers. And those rules, um, the Digital Markets Act and the Digital Services Act hit in 2023. So I, I know Facebook has gone out to a lot of researchers 
to, um, for example, talk about like healthy diets and like how Facebook communities can like really promote both. So I think there are researchers who work closely who weren't part of that group. I think that's going to change through regulation. And um, yeah, and, and Facebook is really much better than like, we really did try to talk to WhatsApp about stuff like, so in which countries do you have a lot of customers? Like, just, just give me network coverage, like just the numbers. No, no, we can't, we can't disclose that. Not like what the content of the message is. So even as I'm criticizing Facebook for being less open than um, what I would like it to be, there are other companies that are far, um, far more restrictive with the information they share. Mm -hmm. I was just going to ask, do you have, um, <clears throat> do you think your work has, gives, shines any light on the refugee crisis on the southern border of the United States and how it might have changed over the last 10 years in terms of technology and so on? So I think some of the issues are kind of exactly the same. So one of the issues I didn't get to had to do with like ethnic tensions and why some groups are prioritized over another and how like groups who have never met before, like for the first time you put these two types of groups in a camp or a detention center and they're gonna develop stereotypes. I uh, didn't get to kind of, the Syrians were privileged, like there's no question legally and in every way, but like the rumors um, spreading among the Syrian community was no, 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 the Afghanis are getting the better treatment. So that kind of, of course the Afghanis thought the uh, Syrians were privileged and that was true. So it's kind of that, those ethnic tensions I think are gonna develop in different kinds of ways. Uh, I think the language issue is huge. I mean, it's not as bad with Spanish as it is with Arabic and Farsi, but I think kind of just people speak to co-ethnics much more um, comfortably. People speak, smugglers are you know, often members of communities who've done exactly the same journey. And we know this from ethnographic research in, on the Southern border and also like, you know, people who've been able to do ethnographic research like in North Korea, like who can do research in North Korea? People have done it just on the border. So you can get some of these patterns. Um, I think the importance of tech and government regulation of tech. So the idea that you have your phone and you need to, um, kind of like good guidance given. So, so right now, kind of a US perspective on the law is like, can the government, you're at an airport, like open your laptop and look for information on it. And do they do it for people who look a certain way? The answer is yes, they can. And yes, they do. And that's not widely known kind of in some of these communities, like the idea that you wanna like delete a lot of information, just have a phone that doesn't have all of your access um, is widely shared because they have, you know, on the one hand, the Syrian government might come to you, the Greek government, the Turkish government, you don't know who's going to be checking your phone. And governments do a lot of this uh, legally, including the US government. Uh, right now, there are people writing on the civil liberty implications of that, but it's widely um, uh, practiced. And yeah, the technology changes. So some of the technology. So if we all go to an airport, there's going to be biometric scanning. Like that was initiated kind of on refugee populations. Initially kind of UNHCR and IOM. UNHCR is a much better organization than IOM. But the idea was, well, like we don't want people, you know, getting their food rations twice. So we will need this identifying information, which is then used for all kinds of purposes. Um, yes, there are, there are some parallels, but of course, Kind of going on the ground and knowing the specifics um, is, is critical as well. Um, my name is Ian, I'm a graduate student here at the high school. Um, I just have two very quick questions. So, last week's speaker talked about how in the US a lot of mis and disinformation is started by uh, less people. So, a small group of people are the ones propagating the most uh, disinformation. Was that similar in this context as well? And then second question I had was, um, I know that there's a lot of shared devices in refugee camps. And I was wondering if you could speak on sort of the network effects of how families or, or you know, groups that are sharing a similar device, uh, how their views might have changed. Great. So let me first um, speak to this question, like who is posting this misinformation and why and why people, so why people are liking it is, perhaps more organic, I don't know what the research is like. I don't know that there were that many. One of, one of the interesting uh, things here was how governments and smugglers were not necessarily promoting their um, 
messages through the most effective means. So that's why I mentioned kind of the Australian government like had a video and they made that video available in the right language. Like other governments at best got a translator really late to give them kind of a piece of paper. So they were not actively involved to my knowledge in um, promoting information. We did find smuggler information and the smuggler information was totally fascinating and included things like what you pay and what you weigh and then like advice like, you know, if you uh, dress in Western clothing and you shave your mustache, you're going to be uh, much more likely to like not get screened like customer like this is how you need to look to, to get the information that was almost certainly posted by um, smugglers, but I don't think we had kind of like active associations, the way you might if you're trying to disrupt an election or trying to make a policy change. But I don't know, like, again, kind of a lot of this information, we don't really know who posted it. Um, on devices and who has access to technology, um, totally fascinating question, because you might think that um, there's going to be a real age difference, right? Like, you might think, like, hey, grandmas um, are not going to be able to access the internet. You might think there's going to be a gender difference, and there is a really big gender difference, but it's less obvious, it's intuitive um, after the fact, but to the extent women are not able to access um, any kind of employment, they might have more time to be able to be on devices. So even though they own fewer devices, they might have more access to look through this information. Um, there are literacy gaps, right? So one of them, there's a huge difference between the Syrian average education level and the Afghani average education level and also the gender uh, makeup. So if not, it's for young boys, Syrians, wide uh, range, Ukrainians are women and children. So kind of there's a gender and age population and also a familiarity with uh, technology. And then there are, let's see what else we can say about the usage of devices. What we know. Um, this question kind of I mentioned like a rumor about like what what are organizations doing like why do we not have Wi-Fi? Can you improve on Wi-Fi? Part of the big um, NGOs so in this space, the Norwegians are really big and they're using their oil money to to train people and to set up refugee associations. And part of what they're doing is creating trainings or creating um, FAQs so that you don't have to go to this government page. They're trying to centralize information so that it is more accessible to more people. Um, but not necessarily very successfully yet at the time. I think we'll have one final question. This one's also from Deirdre. It's a little more theoretical. Uh, she's wondering how information vacuums relate to data voids identified by social media researchers as creating opportunities for disinformation actors. And are there ways your findings might generalize to disinformation issues such as voting that we're facing today? Yeah, so to me, like information vacuums are, I mean, I think active disinformation where people promote it and someone is paying so that a particular item, you know, a particular view of an electoral candidate, a particular view of a policy issue, like we have some research from an earlier era about how you actively promote a falsehood or you actively promote a particular framing that is partial. But information vacuums, uh, to me, we're kind of new work to try to understand what, what is happening. I am um, very worried that with the collapse of kind of traditional news organizations or with the centralization of some of them and the collapse of others and the idea that you can access information and rely, depending on your age, on TikTok. You can rely, like you can never turn on, uh, or if depending on your political orientation, um, that to me is fascinating and how you how you penetrate that sphere once somebody has opted out and seriously distressed you worries me um, a lot like I thought at the time that this was a problem with these refugees who have like personally been persecuted by their government or had like by definition like their, their society collapsed even if they're not formally refugees something horrible happened uh, or the economic opportunity but now kind of thinking about how do you take a society where um, there's just been such an attack on the media, where people are um, turning to alternative sources and, and super distressful of other sources and speaking to one another. Um, the only thing I can say is Laura, who is one of my co-authors and is now a Harvard professor, has gone back to research on the Nazis for this. So once we um, 
won World War II, we were very, very concerned that uh, the information environment in Germany would be terrible for a while, that people would lie about what they believed in, would secretly harbor Nazi ideology. So we set up kind of this big polling institute in Allensbach, and we had like a, an infrastructure, like how do you train people who like just recently were following Hitler into kind of believing in these new ideas that we are imposing. And some of her research is um, about tipping points. And that was kind of the, the work on the Nazis and the work on the far right uh, today, which suggests that um, when you're 10%, when you believe you're 10% of a community, when you believe you're 15% of the community, you might like not say what you believe. You know you're a minority, you know you don't talk to everyone. If for some reason you believe your belief is more mainstream, you come out of the hiding and you start sharing this with more people. So um, how do you keep misinformation levels very low? And kind of what happens after you cross that tipping point uh, is uh, part of her work on kind of how Hungary turned from democratic to authoritarian so quickly. Uh, and she's done some fabulous experimental work on kind of how you can manipulate, like you can do experimental work that is more robust and say like you give people two bits of information, like in your province, 50% of people vote for the far right versus in the country, 20% of people vote for the far right and how you can, if you, if you tell people about what their neighbors are thinking and this is new information to them, then they might um, reveal more truthful information. That means that more extreme information that was previously hidden is in the public sphere, but also that it can be corrected. Um, but the short answer is, I don't, I don't know. All right, well, I think that's true of a lot in this space, but we learned some from you as well. So thank you again. I think we have some refreshments outside. Thank you.